Hello, everyone. So good morning. Um, I forgot our 30 second intro there. So excuse me for that. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure and science into classrooms around the world. And if you're coming back for like the 10th time or the sixth time on this epic series, well, then welcome back. It has been such a pleasure and privilege personally and professionally. Uh, that's a lot of peace to highlight such amazing people from around the globe and amazing places. So as you guys may know, this is our Cross Canada virtual road trip. So we have been out with Parks Canada and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society on five epic adventures so far. We've gone up to the Northwest Territories, to Nahani National Park, and to Pingo National Landmark. We've gone to Quebec, to Gros Eel and the quarantine site there, and Saguenay St. Lawrence Marine Park, and all the way to the East Coast to Kuchibuguac National Park. It's been such a special opportunity to hear from amazing people, see conservation stories in the field, and explore some of Canada's most incredible landscapes and conservation work. So today we are going far, far away from Kushibuguak to the other coast on the west end of Canada. And we are joined by the team at our next spot, which is the Fort Rod Hill and Fisgard Lighthouse National Historic Sites. So we're going to meet two very different families today who call the Juan de Fuca Strait home. We're going to join Parks Canada interpreters at the oldest permanent lighthouse on the west coast of Canada. Fisgard Lighthouse lights the way into Eskimo Harbour and looks out over the Juan de Fuca Strait, a busy highway for ships to navigate on their way to Victoria. This area is also home to the lighthouse keepers and their families and to Joy the Orca along with the rest of the southern resident killer whale population there. While the families of Fisgard lived ashore in the lighthouse, Joy and her family continue to call the waters of the Juan de Fuca Strait home. So today we're going to explore this special place and learn about some of the benefits and challenges of living in this unique ecosystem. I also want to highlight before we get underway, of course, we have live questions today. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to get more questions than we can possibly answer. So I encourage you all to check out our Padlet for today's program, where you can share more questions after the broadcast is done. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Emily. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And take us away. Hello, bonjour. My name is Emily. I'm a Parks Canada interpreter. Heishka, merci, and thank you for joining me here on this beautiful morning at Fisgard Lighthouse National Historic Site. So I'm speaking to you today from just outside Fisgard Lighthouse, as you can see. <laughs> um, the oldest permanent lighthouse on the west coast of Canada, built in 1860 at the mouth of Esquimalt Harbour at the southern end of Vancouver Island. This lighthouse is located on the traditional territories of the Songhees or Lekwungen and Esquimalt nations who have been and continue to be uh, the stewards and caretakers of the beautiful land and ocean you see around me here. And today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, the history of Fisgard Lighthouse and its role as a beacon of safety uh, for the ships coming up and down the coast here in the Juan de Fuca Strait. Uh, my partner, Athena, who will be joining us from uh, the nearby Gulf Island National Park Reserve, and I are also going to be introducing to you, uh, you to some of the different families who call this area home, because this area is not only just a busy superhighway for ships coming to Victoria and beyond, but it is also home to many families of all different shapes and sizes. But before we look at those families too closely, uh, we need to make sure we understand what was happening in Victoria and on the coast of British Columbia before the lighthouse was even built. And so our story begins with the use of uh, the waterways here as highways for trade and travel. And the use of the uh, oceans and rivers around here as highways began with the First Nations peoples of this area. And so as I mentioned before, I am standing today on the Coast Salish, uh, on the territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Lekwungen or Songhees, and Esquimalt First Nations who have been here since time immemorial. And the First Nations of these lands were closely connected to other Coast Salish communities and other communities all up and down the coast, uh, traveling the waters in the large, strong dugout canoes. Um, these canoes could be speedy, uh, speedy crafts or ginormous 70-foot uh, vessels full of trade goods. And using these canoes, Coast Salish communities here uh, were able to connect with um, not just other communities on the lower part of Vancouver Island, but with other Indigenous groups far into the Fraser River and uh, up and down the West Coast as well. And something you'll see throughout this presentation is that the ability to access and navigate the ocean has always been super duper important for all people here living on the coast. 
Now, when traders, uh, European uh, explorers and traders first came to this area, they were seeking fur, they were seeking uh, timber, they were seeking fish and land, all these sorts of resources. Um, and fur was particularly important to them. They quite liked this, but they were coming to this area here uh, by boat. And um, they were finding so many resources in this area here. There's such an abundance of them that uh, it eventually led to the establishment of British trading posts and forts all along the West Coast here, which included Fort Victoria, operated by the Hudson's Bay Company and established in the 1840s. And in its early days, Fort Victoria, it was a pretty small uh, fort. There was just a few hundred uh, settlers living in and around the, the area of the fort, trading things like furs. Um, but that all changed in 1858. Um, gold was discovered in the Fraser Valley, which led to thousands and thousands of miners and prospectors descending on little old Fort Victoria. All these new faces coming to the area, they were all coming here by boat. Many of them had never been to this area before and they were not familiar with this coastline. Um, I'm not sure if any of you uh, have been to the West Coast before, but if you have, you will likely uh, know how unfamiliar and unpredictable um, our coastline can be to uh, newbies in terms of weather and in terms of uh, land features. So we have a very dynamic, unpredictable weather system. It'll be sunny and beautiful like it is today in uh, in the morning, and then it will be pouring with rain in the afternoon. It'll be a beautiful bluebird day, still and calm, and then all of a sudden, boom, gale force winds come through. We also have lots of uh, tricky fjords and uh, hidden reefs just tucked below the ocean's surface along the coast here. And so with all of these obstacles, um, and because they were quite unfamiliar with this area, the huge increase of boat traffic coming uh, to the coast because of the gold rush led to a huge increase in shipwrecks. So many so that this area was dubbed the graveyard of the Pacific claiming over 2,000 wrecks and 700 lives, stretching from the northern part of coastal Oregon uh, all the way up past the Juan de Fuca Strait right here where we are, and all the way to the top of Vancouver Island. And uh, because of all of these tragic shipwrecks happening, the government thought we needed some safety upgrades to this marine highway. And so uh, Fisgard Lighthouse was one of those safety measures. A beacon of light atop a tall, tall tower uh, to light the way and guide ships safely into Esquimalt Harbor. The first of many lighthouses that continue to safely uh, guide ships up and down the coast to this day. So that was a whole lot of history I just covered there. That was a lot. Um, but I hope now you can understand how this marine highway led to the development of Victoria and Fisgard Lighthouse. Uh, but how was this lighthouse operated? Who called this place home? It's, a, it's called a lighthouse, so that implies that there was someone living in it. Um, and whenever I talk about the lighthouse to people, I always like to ask them what time they go to sleep at night. And usually my answers are like, eight o'clock, nine o'clock for early birds. I'm more of a night owl myself. I go to bed closer to 11. Um, but if you were a lighthouse keeper here in uh, the 1860s when Fisgard was built, you had no such luxury. You had to stay up all night to keep the light at the top of the tower lit. And if uh, that was an incredibly important job, if it wasn't done properly, boats could get lost and they could crash. So when the lighthouse was built in 1860, the light was an oil lamp, which is not anything like a modern electric light. There was no on and off switch. I have a little miniature household oil lamp here to just sort of illustrate my point. But the lighthouse keeper's job was to make sure there was enough oil in the lamp to keep the light burning and that the wick, which is the part just inside here that would be on fire, didn't burn out. And this meant that every four hours, the lighthouse keeper had to get out of his blankets, climb out of his bed or his chair, and climb up the tower, the steep, steep steps to the top of the 48-foot tower to tend to their duties. 
They also had to make sure the lens of the of the light was super clean. The fire would often create soot that would fog up the lens. They had to clean the glass as well every four hours with delicate brushes and cloths. They had to be so careful with these pieces of equipment because it was it was very important to be gentle with this equipment. If anything happened to it, if it broke, that would be bad news. Everything took a lot longer back in those days. There was no Amazon Prime or next day shipping. Um, so if you needed a new lens because you broke it, you would be waiting weeks and weeks for a replacement to come by boat. And staying up all night to tend to the light, that doesn't sound like an easy job, huh? So uh, lighthouse keepers were often living here with their families who took on the role of assistant lighthouse keepers. And the assistants also had to clean, they had to cook, uh, they had to keep everything neat and tidy in the house so it could run in as smoothly as possible for day-to-day -day maintenance. The spouses or wives of the lighthouse keepers often took on these roles and were important in making sure everything at the lighthouse ran smoothly. They kept it all, they kept it ship shape. Even children your age, uh, when they were old enough and they felt like they were ready, they could sometimes uh, help out the lighthouse keeper taking a break from watching the light during the, uh, during the night. And it was nice having your family to help out the lighthouse and keep you company because Fisgard was still very isolated at this time. Um, so uh, the families here had to be very self-sufficient. They had to make sure they had enough firewood and coal to burn in their stove or they would get cold or they couldn't cook their food. And if they didn't have enough food, they couldn't just go to the grocery store and they would go hungry. So they relied on shipments that came to Fisgard every three months. They would send food by ship. The government would send food by ship uh, every three months. And that contained most things they needed. Uh, things like coffee, things like sugar and flour, beans, um, all those sorts of good necessities. But that's like if you only went grocery shopping once every three months. That's a huge amount of time waiting in between shops. And so the families of Fisgard looked to the ocean and beaches around them uh, to supplement their uh, their diet. So our beaches here and our oceans are filled with yummy, yummy things like uh, fish and clams and mussels and crab. Mmm, tasty. <laughs> and so lighthouse keepers, uh, some lighthouse keepers even were quite ambitious. They had a small gardens um, on, the, on this little rocky island here where they could grow things like lettuce, potatoes and carrots, fresh vegetables to supplement the rations they got from the government. Nowadays, of course, we have a causeway, like a, a sidewalk connecting Fisgard Island, where the lighthouse is, to the shore. We also have an acrylic lens and an electric light, so uh, it does not require such extensive cleaning and maintenance, and it can turn on and off automatically. And with these type of upgrades, there's actually no need for a family to be living at the lighthouse anymore. But the light at Fisgard still shines every night to guide ships safely down the coastline. And now we'll be heading over to Athena's video. She's going to be talking about a family that still calls this area home. Fantastic, Emily. What enthusiasm. That was great. I still can't get over a beautiful bluebird day. Uh, I'll yes. How <laughs> nice is that? I'm going to bring in Athena. And then, Athena, if you want to start off and just dive in, I can turn it over to the video or give you a second to chat, whatever you'd like. Um, well, did you have the map that I gave you? Maybe that would help. I could just pl plunk up the map for a second. Yeah, let me bring that back up for everybody. Just give me two quick seconds here. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Got that map and we're all set. Do share. Yeah. Okay, so you can see here um, down in the bottom, there's Victoria and that little orange dot there with the one, that's where Emily is right now. She's at Fiskard Lighthouse. And if you sort of go up towards Vancouver, there's a yellow dot there and there's a few little islands. I, and that's where I'm gonna be talking from is Gulf Islands National Park Reserve. So we're pretty close to each other. The whole area in the ocean that's shaded as blue, that is the critical habitat of the Southern resident killer whales. And that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So I think okay. that's good enough and we can launch into the video. That's perfect, let's play yeah. it. Take us away. Hello, bonjour. And welcome to Gulf Islands National Park Reserve. It's the homeland of the Coast Salish First Nations. My name is Athena and I am a park interpreter here. You might notice we're not at Fiskard Lighthouse anymore. We're on Saturna Island and it's a small island with only 300 people. I, I live here. 
Then there's, we're in East Point. Point the sticks out into the water. East Point is a lot like Fiskard Lighthouse in that when ships come by, they have wrecked and crashed on the rocks. So there was a lighthouse here. And um, this is the last bit, this little building here is the last bit of the old lighthouse. It used to have a fog alarm in it. And that fog alarm, you know, when it was, when it was foggy and the ships couldn't see where they were going, it made a sound. And it was like, bah, wah. <laughs> and that told ships, don't come near here, you might crash. So sometimes when I'm here, I hear a different noise. It's in the ocean. It is an animal. It sounds like this. And then I see a giant dorsal fin come out of the water. Come and see. This is life size. This is a, this dorsal fin. So what animal is this? Your guess. If you thought orca or killer whale, yay, you're right. So these animals live here and this place, I want you to see, can you see the boat going by? Can you? It's just like Emily said, it's a highway for boats. There's a giant ship going by, it's loaded with cargo and lots of ships come and go from here. My question is for you, is what happens when a home for animals like this killer whale turns into a highway for boats? That's my big question. But first I want to talk about killer whales for a minute. So they are, they're black and white and they have a big dorsal fin. There's lots of killer whales all over the world. Every ocean in the world has different types of killer whales. The killer whale I'm talking about today is one, one type. It's called the Southern Resident Killer Whale. Now that's a pretty big name, so I thought I better, I better write it down so that you didn't forget. So Southern Resident Killer Whale. This is one type of whale that lives in the waters around here. And we're gonna look at one particular little whale of the Southern Residents. And her name is Joy. And it, you can see, this is a picture taken by Monica Willen Shields, just on another little island over here. She was standing on the shore and the orcas came by and she took a picture. And look, there's little Joy when she was a calf. She's so cute. And this, she's right beside her mom, Matya. And Southern resident killer whales stay beside their moms their whole life long. Now, Joy isn't a baby anymore. She's nine years old, and here's a more recent picture of her. There she is, grown up a bit. But look, she's beside her uncle, Mega. And Mega had a big, huge dorsal fin. So we're going to think when we, we talk about what's happening here in the waters about little Joy and how it, this highway of ships impacts her and her life. So let's go. Let's just go over here to Boundary Pass so we have the pass behind us. You can probably still hear the noise of that ship. And I am going to be talking about ship noise in a minute. So that's pretty, uh, it's pretty right on that the ship went by right this minute. So for a minute, I want you to think about what would happen to, you know, what do you need to, to uh, have a home? Like, what makes your home your home? Perhaps it's that you feel safe inside it. You have walls and a roof. Maybe it's that you have food in your cupboard. You open the cupboard and mm, there's food there. Or perhaps, oh, there's family around that care about you. Well, little Joy is, uh, is her home is the same. <laughs> she, she needs to feel safe. And she needs a whole big ocean to feel safe because from the minute she's born, she starts swimming and swimming and swimming and she never stops. I mean, never, not even to sleep. So she needs a lot of open space to move around. And then she needs food. So her favorite food, come on, Madeline. Madeline's gonna help me here, 
is the Chinook salmon. Of course, the orca is much bigger than the salmon, but you can, that is the real size of a Chinook salmon. And it's the biggest and fattest salmon on the West Coast. To fish for her food, see if you went under the water behind me and went way down deep, it would be like, it would be very, very dark, like you got closed your eyes. So how do you find your fish? Any ideas? Joy uses her sense of hearing, echolocation. And there's a clue in that word echolocation, the word echo, because when you send out an echo, it bounces on a cliff or something and comes back to you. Same thing, Joy sends out a click from her melon. It goes out, it hits the salmon, it comes back and she hears it in her jaw. So let's try this. Where's the salmon? Where's the salmon? Where's the salmon? Oh, she hears it and there it is. And then she swims and gobbles it up. Of course, she's much bigger. <laughs> Thank you, Madeline. So Joy needs to feel safe. She needs food and she needs family. Cause uh, you know, Southern resident killer whales swim very, very close together. And when they get a salmon, they don't just gobble it up. They call their family around and they tear it up and they share it. That is how a little orca like Joy can grow big and strong, even though she's maybe not as great a fisher as her relatives. So here we go. Now we have this problem of the highway for ships coming through. And I want to tell you, this is not a small problem. This is a super highway. There's 7 million people living in this area between Victoria, Vancouver, and Seattle. And that ship that you saw go by, it is bringing stuff from China and Japan. It will offload onto trains. The trains will go across Canada. And I bet you anything, you probably have something in your home or in your school that came from those ships. So it is super highway going through and guess what's happening? It's really impacting the Southern residents and they are becoming, it, it's, it's not good. And I'll tell you some of the things that happen. They are not safe. Here's a, here's a ship. And guess what happens? Sometimes Southern residents get struck or orcas get struck by ships and that's, and it kills them. The other thing is, so ships, are very noisy. They have motors. And now I want you to come back. Come on back, Madeline with the orca. So here's little Joy. She's trying to find her fish. She's sending out her echolocation. Here she's getting close, but there's a really loud ship. She goes, where's the salmon? Can't hear anything. Where's the salmon? <laughs> Thanks, Madeline. You can see there's a problem. It's too noisy with the ship motor for the echolocation to work. And scientists have found that Southern residents are not able to fish as much when there are boats around. So and another thing is when they can't talk to their families as well because they call underwater and they just, they can't hear it. It's sort of like when you're at a playground and it's really noisy, you have to shout to be heard. Well, scientists have found the same thing, that southern resident killers are just shouting at each other. It's not a very good situation. So what, what does this all mean? Ooh, this means that southern residents are in trouble. Their numbers are going down and they are endangered. This means they're at risk of disappearing forever. So we don't want this to happen. We, we call them a species at risk when they're endangered. I'll tell you, I'll show you something. I had to print it out because it's a sad number. That's how many southern resident killer whales are left. Only 75. And there used to be more. So their numbers are going down. And I bet in your school you have more students than this. Southern resident killer whales do not breed with other killer whales. So this is it. This is all there is of Joy and her, her extended family. So what can we do to turn this number up again and make it so that Joy has lots of new brothers and sisters and cousins um, and they have lots of food 
and safe homes. Well, we can do it. It's just going to take all of us working together. So I'm going to tell you something that Parks Canada is doing. Um, to, and I'm just pointing that way because we need a sign. It's taped to the back of the dorsal fin. Oh my gosh, can Madeline get it for me? I'll talk about Parks Canada while she's getting it for me. Uh, here we go. Um, so what is Parks Canada doing and what can you do to help Southern Resident Killer Whales? Well, Parks Canada, you, you, know, you might think of parks as being just on land, but my park is here in the water too. These waters are part of Gulf Islands National Park Reserve. And the same with the other two national park preserves on the west coast of Canada. They have water inside park boundaries. This means that Parks Canada is responsible for helping the species at risk on land and in the sea. So southern resident killer whales pass through here. That means we are responsible for taking care of them. One of the things we're doing is we've made these little signs. These go up on uh, marinas where boats are parked and they let boaters know endangered keep your distance it's the law so it's telling boaters to stay away from killer whales and this is going to be good because it'll be less noisy it's kind of like those signs on the highway that say watch out for deer or watch out for bear well this is watch out for killer whales and what can you do to help well if you're on the west coast check out a website called thewhaletrail.org and it tells you great places to watch for whales on land like right here at East Point. If you're not on the west coast you can learn more about Southern Resident Killer Whales. I'm going to put some links there in the chat so you can find out more and learn about the species at risk in your backyard in your area what you can do to help them. So I want to finish here by saying that when a home for animals becomes a highway for boats, it is not a good thing. It, it has created a species at risk, the southern resident killer whales. But we can do things to help Joy and her family so that those numbers go up and our oceans are healthy for them. Thank you very much for joining me on this virtual school tour and I will be I will be here to answer questions. Bye, you guys. Oh, Athena and Emily, that was spectacular. Professional detachment completely out the window. Teachers in the chat have been saying this is the best presentation they've seen, and we've done a lot of presentations. So way to go. The history at the beginning there, that amazing story of the whale, the diorama with the scarily large uh, fish compared to the whale. That was spectacular. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of that. Um, I've been putting all the links in the chat. We've seen whaletrail.org. If you want to find out how your classroom or group can help protect resident killer whales, do check those links out. We've also got the Padlet up for the many more questions that are going to come in than we can possibly answer in one broadcast. But with that, I'm going to dive in with Q&A. We've got tons of live groups uh, in YouTube, over 12 classes around North America. We've got our groups live, so it's like several hundred kids, 300, 400 kids from across the continent. Um, well deserved for such a great talk. Let's dive in. Athena, I know we're going to get a lot of whale questions, so I'm going to leave you in the background for a minute, and I'll, we'll, we'll come. We're going to get so many, so I'm going to give some to Emily because we had some great ones in the chat, and then I'll come to our live classes in just a minute. So Emily, our first question is from Mr. Sellen's class. Simon at Pinecrest Public School wants to know, what salary, uh, if any, did lighthouse keepers make? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, so lighthouse keepers would not make very much money. Um, back in the 1860s, they were making um, around, um, I would say, 100 to 200, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> $400 uh, dollars per, per annum, so for a year. Wow. Um, there, uh, there's a couple of cases, though, which is really interesting, where the wives of the lighthouse keepers um, would also be paid as assistant lighthouse keepers. Um, it was a pretty male-dominated field uh, for a long time. <laughs> so the fact that the wives were um, being compensated for all the hard work they were doing as well is pretty interesting, too. 
but they would make like under under a hundred. <laughs> it was not very much. <laughs> that is very interesting, though. Fairly unique at that time in the world. So very cool. All right, Indeed, yes. one more lighthouse one, and then we'll take it to our live classes. Miss Hill, I'm coming to you first in just a minute. But Miss Smith, grade four fives, want to know what would happen if you ran out of food before the next delivery. <laughs> Oh, that is a good question. <laughs> we all like to be well fed, don't we? <laughs> um, so as, a, as I mentioned in the presentation, you could uh, go out into the oceans around you and fish for food. The lighthouse keepers also had a rowboat on the island. So if there was an emergency, they could row to shore and go to the, the village of Esquimalt to try and get some food if they needed that. Um, if they did leave the island at any time, they were meant to hire on their own dime a replacement to watch the lighthouse for them if they had to leave. They were not allowed to leave the lighthouse unattended even during the day. And in fact, we uh, we have some letters of uh, lighthouse keepers getting in big trouble for, for leaving the lighthouse, even to just go to the beach nearby. <laughs> um, so that was one way that they could do, uh, they could... Um, sort of supplement their uh, their diet in case uh, in case they ran out of rations. And they had to be careful too because a lot of the rations that came to them, they would have been uh, in barrels and boxes and crates and they would have been sitting out on the dock in Victoria um, or on the port in Esquimalt for a while before, um, before bringing them to the island. Uh, and uh, sometimes they'd be contaminated with seawater. So um, you have to be careful about that. Sometimes uh, food would have um, pests in it, so it wouldn't be very good to eat. So they did have to be very reliant on the, the abundance in the waters around them and on the beaches here to, to keep fed. <laughs> very, very cool. I'd love to see those letters. I don't know if you actually have to come to the historic sites to see them or if they're online anywhere, but they sound amazing. <laughs> Yes, we actually have a really amazing archive of, of uh, letters and um, other documents from the lighthouse. But uh, you, unfortunately, they're not digitized, so you'll have to come we'll, visit. We'll have to come when uh, the world opens up again. We'll all get on a plane and come see you guys. How cool is sounds that? Sounds good. Can't well, wait to see you all. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much, Emily. And we're going to come on to our live classes now. Miss Hill's class is joining us in Keswick, Ontario. Uh, if you want to unmute your microphone, come on in uh, and uh, go for it with a question. All right, thank you. We're so excited to be here. This has been a wonderful presentation. Um, and I have so many questions, but we'll start with this one from Avery. She's wondering, I guess this is for Emily. Um, have there been have there been any um, like shipwrecks um, over the years in the past that um, that may have um, been caused uh, by the ships not being able to see properly? That is an awesome question. Um, there have been lots of shipwrecks. Um, here uh, at Fisgard, I actually have a photo. I'm not sure if it's gonna come across super duper clear, but I have a photo here of Fisgard Lighthouse. This is um, uh, in the uh, late 19th century, so late 1800s. There's actually a shipwreck right here. That's the Delaware, and it accidentally ran aground here, even though the lighthouse was right next to it. Um, we have a, a lighthouse just uh, just across from us, uh, up the way a bit, up the coastline that we can actually see from here called Race Rocks. And that's sort of our sister lighthouse. It was built around the same time as us. And there have been a few really tragic shipwrecks off of that uh, lighthouse as well. Um, it's, uh, yeah, lots of reefs, lots of hidden rocks tucked under the surface. You can't really see it. And, you know, back in these days, they didn't have GPS. They didn't have Google Maps. So if they didn't know the rocks were there, um, it would be pretty tricky to, do, to see them otherwise. Yeah, great question, Miss Hill. And thank you, Emily, for that. I want to harp on race rocks for a second. We've had on our broadcast many times Jill Heinerth, who is probably Canada, if not the world's foremost adventurer and explorer. She has dove all over the planet and coastal BC and race rocks is one of her favorite places to dive. She consistently says it's the best place to dive on the planet, so it's very, very cool. Uh, hopefully you guys get a chance to check that out. All right, Ms. Young's class, grade six is joining us in Markham, right down the road from me here in Toronto. Uh, unmute your microphone, you're good to go. Hi, uh, thank you. We have several questions actually about the living in the lighthouse for Emily. So one of the questions is, what is the minimum height a lighthouse has to be in order to be effective and how far can the light shine so that you can see it uh, from the waters? 
That is an amazing question. Oh my goodness. I have, I've been working here for two years now and I've actually never been asked about the, the necessary height for a, for a lighthouse tower. Um, they range a lot. Uh, I would have to, uh, I'll, I'll probably take your contact info and find you a more direct answer, um, and send it your way. Um, Ours is 48 feet. There, are, there. Are, I can uh, think of several uh, lighthouses on the coast here that are a bit shorter, but typically you want it high, high above the water line so that it's as visible as possible. Um, although our our tower is only 48 feet tall, it stands um, over 70 feet above the water just with the tide line and then being up on the rock. Um, and uh, as for your second question, um, that's also a good one. Um, I'm uh, sorry. 16? 16 kilometers. Uh, so <laughs> <I believe. laughs> um, my co-worker was just saying to me, it's uh, our light is visible from uh, 16 kilometers away, one six. Very, very cool. By the way, uh, this has been so much fun. You guys are such rebels. I expected we were going to be inundated with whale questions. So thank you so much for being so fascinated with the lighthouse, guys. This is great. Um, let's head to Ms. Metternach's class. They're joining us live in Calgary, Alberta. If you guys have a question for us, come on in. Um, how much oil would they put in the old lighthouse lamp? Just a little bit. You would just need a, you don't want to, um, have to waste any. So you would just put a little bit in at a time and make sure you kept it topped up. It wasn't super huge. Um, uh, the, the light of the lighthouse was actually, and still is to this day, what we're using now, it's quite small, um, smaller than you would expect. The important part that makes the light so visible and powerful is actually the lens that's around the light. Um, it has special, it's a specially made lens to refract light and make it shine even farther and brighter. Um, but it didn't necessarily need a big flame or a whole huge drum of oil. Very cool. Thanks, Emily. This has been great. Um, I'm going to head now to Mr. LeBron's class there in Mississauga, Ontario. Come on in, guys. Take us away. Hi. Uh, we've also got a question for Emily. We're really interested in these lighthouses here. Uh, Julia in my class wanted to know a couple things. First of all, she wanted to know um, how long it took for the government to build the lighthouse. So how long were shipwrecks going on before the lighthouse was there? And then uh, kind of what, what what year was the lighthouse built in? And then the second part to her question is the same way that um, ships could be in danger because of the weather, too much fog or storms, which might run them uh, aground. She was wondering if the weather also was a danger to some of the lighthouse keepers there. Awesome questions. Thank you. Um, to your first question, there's uh, there have always been shipwrecks and disasters happening on the ocean here. We only have um, records of 2000 happening, um, but they were going on uh, long, long before um, a tragedy on the ocean was happening long, long before uh, European settlers were coming here. And it um, uh, so it was when Victoria as, as a Fort Victoria, as a settlement was established. And then with all of these, within a few years, all of these, uh, miners coming here for the gold rush, that was when they noticed a drastic increase in shipwrecks, um, just because there was more traffic here. Um, and, uh, so to just help protect in, in 1860, two years after the gold rush started, they decided to build the lighthouse. Um, it just it took uh, a year to build and the lamp was lit in um, uh, November uh, of 1860. So just in time for the winter storms. And can you repeat what the, the second question was there? I'm sorry, I uh, forgot. Yeah, yeah no. Um, Julia wanted to know if there was any, uh, if the weather there was at all dangerous for the lighthouse keepers? Were, were they at any risk from the bad weather that would uh, run the ships ashore? Yes, they definitely were. Um, this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is a very isolated spot and lighthouses all along the west coast here were all very isolated. Um, so the weather would, uh, we get lots of cold 
win, uh, cold rain, uh, lots of uh, strong winds and big waves. And um, so we've actually found the, the letters, again, letters from the lighthouse keepers to the government asking for repairs to windows, repairs for the bricks because it's crumbling from the salt of the ocean. Um, so it definitely had a huge effect on uh, for the lighthouse keepers, the, the bad weather here that we can get. Um, in some cases too, it would, um, uh, it would just, yeah, it would cause, uh, sickness and, and, um, then they'd be isolated here and unable to go to the hospital. So it was, a, it was a very difficult life. I think we kind of romanticize the idea of living in a lighthouse, but it was hard work. It was cold, hard work, and it was very isolated. <laughs> Fantastic, guys. Um, all right, let's go into another round of questions. I'm going to inspire some whale action here by taking a few from YouTube. So Ms. Smith's class wants to know, Athena, uh, what's the life expectancy of an orca? How long do they live? Come on. Um, it's different between male and female orcas. So um, females live can, on average of 50 years up to 90, and males don't live quite as long, so 30 to 60 years. Yeah. Fantastic. And then Ms. DuPont's class wants to know, how are boats supposed to avoid the whales? You talk about these like mutual super highways. Uh, is there a way that we can prevent boats from hitting whales altogether? Yeah, there's a really great system. It's called a whale report app. And so you got you have it on your phone and, and if anybody sees whales, they, they, they report it. And those reports go directly to the ship captains. And I was actually at East Point um, last year and I saw some, they weren't the killer whales with their humpbacks going by and I did my whale report app there's a big freighter going by and then the freighter slowed and it started to turn so we're getting more uh, like good reporting to let people know when there's whales and for those ship captains to be aware of it very very cool one of the things we've had on the broadcast before uh, Bill Halliday works out in Victoria and goes up to the north every year does marine soundscapes and they're trying to figure out shipping in the Arctic as well which is a place that there's more shipping how do you avoid it becoming an issue up there with some of the amazing species that we have on our northern coast so really glad we got a chance to highlight that as well all right Miss Hill come on back in unmute that mic and keep the train going here <laughs> all right so we have lots of whale questions too um, so I'm going to try and do like a two part question. So um, BB is wondering if there are any other risks to the orcas in the area besides ships maybe hitting them like is fishing an issue and nets and that sort of thing. And then is there anyone um, who's like enforcing or protecting the orcas? Is there anyone who's out sort of um, like looking for problems? That's great questions. Yes. Um, we, we consider there's three main risks to the southern resident killer whales. Um, well, lack of prey, there's not as much salmon as there used to be out there. And that's for a, a great variety of reasons. And then I mentioned it's difficult to fish with the boats. So there's a lack of prey, lack of Chinook salmon, their favorite food. And then the, um, uh, <laughs> um, contamination. So there's contamination in the water and disturbance from boats. So those are the three. Lack of prey, disturbance, and um, contamination. This is something we hear about with a lot of conservation things. Is that It's not just one issue in isolation. It tends to be a lot of things all happening at once. And so that's why it's so important for citizen scientists to get out, for whale sighting networks to, uh, you know, every little bit helps to help protect amazing species like this. And we got a chance to see this just incredible ecosystem today behind you in that video. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, I just add to the second part to that question is that yes, there are people out in the water parks, Canada, law enforcement, they're giving friendly reminders to like recreational boaters who are too close to orcas and same with fisheries and oceans, Canada, there's officers out there. So there's a lot of people on the water also, you know, staying away from the orcas, but also telling other boats to stay away too. Yeah, this is such a communal effort and so exciting. Again, I've shared all the Parks Canada conservation work in the YouTube comment section or chat bar so people can check that out and we'll highlight that in the comment section after the broadcast as well. Um, Miss Young's class, if you guys have a question for us, come on in, go for it. We, we do have a question. Actually, it's a multi-part question. So one of the uh, questions is, how do you identify Joy the or Orca? How do you know where she's born and how can you tell how old she is? Oh, I love this. I'm ready for this. Okay, so you see I've got a cut out of an orca here and you see this thing right here, this white mark, that is called a saddle patch. And each Southern resident has a unique saddle patch. It's like our thumbprint, Everybody, everyone is different. 
And so we have, uh, like, we have these books. Let's see, this is the family groups. And in this, it shows every single mom, brother, sister. We've been keeping track of them for a long time now. So I think it's probably since the 70s. So that um, we wouldn't know exactly maybe where uh, uh, exact day Joy was born, but we certainly know this first time we spotted her with her mother. Because um, we even know what who was Machia because of the, the saddle patch. And some of them have dorsal fins that have notches out of them and things like that. That helps us identify them too. So we know aunties, uncles, grandmas, grandpas. We, we know all those 75 orcas very well. Athena, usually I'm the most enthusiastic person in the broadcast. And between you and Emily, I'm like a distant third today. It's so awesome. <laughs> uh, let's take two more questions from our live groups before we wrap up. Time flies and you're having fun, people. Uh, so let me go to Miss Metternach's class. Back to Calgary. Good morning, guys. Oh, hi. What are the, why are killer whales called killer whales? Why are, I didn't, I couldn't hear you. Why are what called what? Yeah. Why are killer whales called killer whales? Why do they have that name, Athena? It's not a very good name, is it? Because I don't know, they're not killers. They don't kill us. Um, they're also, more people are changing them to, to orcas. But I think when the name, they were named killer whales, humans were afraid that they were killers. They're kind of scary. You saw the size of that dorsal fin. If that comes out of the water right beside you, and I remember I told you there's different types of orcas. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I have a tooth here. Check it out. That is an orca tooth. So an animal with a tooth like that is kind of scary. There, one of the other types of orcas that's in our waters, they're called transients or bigs. So they eat seals and porpoises. And people would have seen them just like bat a seal out of the water and gobble it up. So they're kind of scary. So that's why. But a lot of people call them orcas now. Yeah. Orca is a really beautiful term, uh, too. But what I want to stress for our class is orcas are pretty much the apex predator of the ocean. They certainly can be. Blue whales have been reported to be hunted by orcas. Great white sharks have been reported to be hunted by orcas. And they've got the most amazing skull in all of nature. When you're done this program, look up killer whale skull, and it's scarier than anything that any dinosaur ever had. Like, it's the most amazing thing to check out. So I hope you guys get the chance to do that. Um, Mr. Lebrun, wrap us up. Come on back in, Mrs. Saga. And and the broadcast. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Kira in my class was making connections to yesterday's presentation uh, about the marine park out uh, in Saguenay. And uh, she, we learned yesterday that the, sometimes whales come and go out of the area and she was wondering if the Southern residents have always been there or if this is more of a recent thing in recent years uh, and if there are other whale species that have also come and gone into the area. Um. Southern residents have been in this area as long as we've been um, watching out for them. They have a really big range, though. They can go all the way down to Oregon, and they've seen up as far as Haida Gwaii. So they come, they do come and go. Um, I've been working with the park for 15 years, and near the beginning, I, in the summer, I would see whales go by every day. Being out East Point, it's like, yay, whales. And now they're coming by less often. They're pretty opportunistic if they're they're going where the fish are, they're going where the Chinook are. So yeah, they have the whole big ocean, they come and go. And now there's more transients here, seal eating and uh, porpoise eating killer whales than there was residents, but humpbacks, they're, they're all moving around. The ocean is a big home for them. I'm really glad you mentioned this personal take on it. I mean, we have the chance today to share this story with kids all across Canada, the US and beyond, but it's that take that, you know, when you came, it was different than it is now. And I think that for every kid in this program today, if you're watching in, ask your parents, ask your teachers about this sort of thing. Even in my lifetime, I've seen a difference in wildlife that, you know, just species that we never used to have here in Toronto are now here. Species that we used to have, we see less of. And so I think that that personal connection is a really important bit to mention. So thank you very much for that, Athena. That was great. Um, guys, I know we could go all day long and we have enough questions to certainly do that. But what I want to do is bring Emily back in and then share a few resources for everyone to keep the learning going at the end of the broadcast. So again, this is part of our Cross Canada virtual road trip. Uh, check out our remaining programs coming up. We are going to Ketchum Kujik, 6,000 kilometers away. Canada is a very big place. So 6,000 kilometers to the east. Uh, tomorrow's program at 11 and 1. Uh, we're also doing this program in French in just an hour and a bit. So stay tuned for that. As I said at the top, this is a partnership between us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, the amazing team at Parks Canada, who you got a chance to hear from today, and of course, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. 
Finally, I want to bring up the whaletrail.org again, which Athena mentioned in her awesome video. So check that out. It's a great resource. The YouTube chat bar has some more great ways to, to keep you know conservation going. And if you want to share more questions, and I know you do, head to Padlet, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, Lighthouse. Athena and Emily are going to be on call for the next three weeks straight just to answer your questions. If there's nothing else other than checking what you guys are sharing. That's what I was told. I don't know. Um, Ladies, this has been so much fun. Thank you so, so much. Is there any last message about these places that you guys want to share with us before we end the broadcast? I'll leave you to it. Um, I, I can just say, uh, I hope that this just sparks your curiosity to explore places, learn their stories, and learn about other species um, and their lives. So nice to be with you this morning. Yes, thank you all for joining us so much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you all. You ask some amazing questions and uh, I can't wait to see some of your faces uh, out this way when we're able to travel more. Fantastic. I'm hoping to come out this year myself, so I'm really excited. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. And what we do at the end of every broadcast, ladies, I'm going to bring in all our groups. Miss Hill, Miss Young, Miss Metternach's whole group of kids, and Mr. LeBron, join us in saying a big thank you and goodbye. Farewell, everybody.